People think that, oh my God, you missed a couple of meals. I'm starving. You're not starving. You're not going to die. You're going to be fine. Your body is supposed to have that physiology. You're supposed to subject your body to this type of flexibility. Because we're addicted to eating in this lifestyle. We want to eat every two, three hours. So we get addicted to the foods, the patterns. We change our circadian pattern of eating and our hormones in our body. So the addiction has to stop. And that's one of the biggest impediments that I find in teaching people how to fast. So I want to get rid of that addiction. So that's one big thing. The second big advantage is what I call metabolic flexibility, that you're supposed to be using another part of your metabolism. So you're getting out of the glucose and out of the sugar and now using another physiology that there are other substrates that you can use for energy in your body. And that gives you a healthier and a better metabolic pathway. You can use one or the other. It's like having a car that can run on two different fuels. So, And that has a whole bunch of advantages associated with it. And the third thing is that once you start fasting and you start changing your hormonal status, now you get a whole bunch of health benefits, coronary artery disease, strokes, blood pressure, obesity-related diseases such as joint disease, degenerative changes, and even dementia. So you get all these advantages. And the fear factors need to be eradicated. Number one, oh, I'm going to run out of vitamins. You know, your liver and other parts of your body can store up to two months worth of vitamins. When I did the research, I was shocked. There are plenty of vitamins that are stored. And that's what it's for. It's for a rainy day. The body was designed in a very supreme fashion. To be able to do that, to store the micronutrients in your liver, you don't need to be popping all those vitamins. Oh, I haven't eaten for two days, so I need to take my multivitamin. If you are nutritionally depleted from the beginning, and let's say you did a spectrocell blood test, which is a test that can look at all your micronutrients and and if the water is missing and you're really depleted, yeah, you might need to take some supplements. But, you know, for most patients, they don't need to do that. Number two, fats. There's plenty of fat storage in your body. If I take away all calories from you today, you, the average person can go at least 30 to 40 days. And I'm not saying that you should, but they can. So the fear factor needs to be taken. People think that, oh my God, you missed a couple of meals. I'm starving. You're not starving. You're not going to die. You're going to be fine. Your body is supposed supposed to have that physiology. You're supposed to subject your body to this type of flexibility. If your body is not flexible in that, in the metabolic way, then I think that you're setting yourself up for degenerative long-term diseases. And there's two forms of addiction that I've discovered with these patients. Well, not me discovered it, but through experience. Firstly, there's the psychological aspect that, you know, you've become Pavlovian. You know, you come home and the first thing you want to do is gorge on some junk food. It's a Pavlovian. It's that house. It's that kitchen. It's that sofa. It's, it's sometimes getting into your car that you, you dig for something. So we need to get rid of that Pavlovian reflex. So I tell patients, okay, when do you eat? What stimulates your thought about food? What makes you crave for it? Is it certain friends that make you do it or a certain environment that do it? So that, that's, that, those are all psychological cues. And then the second part of it is the true chemical addiction. Uh, Addiction, which I do believe that is really true because these processed foods, especially sugar, sugar is number one. It goes to the dopamine center and now all of a sudden, the next time you eat sugar, you need more and more of it and there's cravings. But you know what? Worse than the cravings, I have to point this out, worse than the cravings are the fact that it changes your brain completely. There's actual neuronal pathway changes that occur in your brain. So when you are eating all those Oreos all the time, you've already got those pathways built into your brain where the rostral pathways from your dopamine center and limbic system, which go to your frontal cortex, they downregulate it. And what does that mean? That means that when you're addicted to that type of food, you can't think straight about that food. That means you've become a little dumber about the intelligence of your diet and your control over your diet because it wants to continue to be addicted. So you don't get so smart about it, okay? Because if you get smart, you're going to not be an addict addict anymore. So <laughs> it, may, it makes your frontal lobe go down in its function. And then it goes to the hippocampus. So there, there's connections that go to the hippocampus that actually make you remember that wonderful feeling that you had when you ate um, five really bad processed food items in a matter of one hour. So you get that. You could break all these down. So yes, you're absolutely right. 
to break those neuronal pathways and the habit pathways, you got to bring in this slowly. So, you know, I do discuss with my patients how far are they along the path of this processed food addiction and, and what is the consumption? I mean, today it's sad that almost 57% of all the calories that they're consuming these days are, are coming from processed or ultra processed foods. So you got to bring that number down. So changing the content of the diet first before we even introduce fasting, I think you're very right. You got to change what they're eating first, because if you just go straight into dieting, they will get a lot of withdrawal symptoms. And then, as I said, you know, they're going to be so dismayed and feel so bad, they'll fall off the bandwagon, they'll never come back again. So mm. do make the change. You got to give them alternative foods. You got to show them that these foods are the ones that are non-addictive foods that you got to get on, which is basically whole foods, real food. If it looks like that in nature, eat it. If it's going to go bad, eat it. If it's got a barcode on it, be suspicious. Don't touch it. If it's got a food label on it, be suspicious. Try not to read it or eat it. Just get rid of it. So just go for real food. I've been a cardiologist for 30 years and I've tried everything. But when I tried fasting, I started seeing changes. People began to lose weight. People's blood pressures came down. Diabetes got reversed. The progression of coronary artery disease went down. You see, I had the benefit of seeing patients from day one. So I saw that they were having a second angioplasty, another heart attack in two years, five years. I saw the numbers going down on those whom I was able to get them to lose weight through a diet fasting program. And I tried lots of uh, diet programs. They didn't seem to work, but fasting did. So decreased blood pressure, decreased diabetes, rehospitalization, LV function seemed to stay good, which means that heart muscle function continue to do well. Patients mentally also seem to be doing better. So fasting gave me not just this benefit, but a lot more. Also, my patients didn't end up in the hospital with fractures or falls and they had stronger muscles and, and mentally they were better. So I started seeing that just generally patients were doing better. ER doctors telling me, how come your, your patients don't end up in the ER with acute heart attacks? All these benefits I saw with yeah. uh, fasting. The patients have to take responsibility because the medical profession, the way it's set up, we're not in a position to do that. You know, we don't have enough resources. We don't have enough time. So what we can do is we can educate patients and we can throw light on the issues that have brought them to where they are now and show them how they can get out of it, show them, empower them and educate them so that they make their decisions, they will do it. Yeah, and then yeah. it's, it's self-empowering, feeds back on themselves and say, look, look, I was able to do this and I didn't think I could do this. And that brings us to that issue that there are so many layers of onions that we can peel off and fasting is the one that really seems to me to open up aspects of their lifestyle which they would not have otherwise looked at because fasting does bring in lots of issues into their life. It opens up the introspection into their life. It's so what's going on? What's driving these things in my life? Yeah, and that's yeah. what I like about fasting. Imagine if I just give them a diet and say, okay, you're just going to eat this. Okay, that's it. But in fasting, it's self-control. It's deeper thinking about the habits so the biochemistry of the body was made for feeding, fasting cycles. And this is the way bioengineering of our body was, but we became dysfunctional because as food became more available, we just kept piling it on and on and on and on. And that's the problem that we have today is exactly what you said, excessive calories too frequently. So our insulin levels stay high all the time. So that's the biggest problem I found as a cardiologist. You're eating all the time, you're stimulating your insulin all the time. Insulin stays high, never gets a chance to come down. And because your insulin doesn't come back down again, you're always in a storage mode. This high insulin is the problem we've hormonally changed because we're eating too frequently. We were not designed to eat that frequently. Insulin is supposed to go up, then come back down again. We stay up all the time. So your body develops, in a simple terms, insulin resistance. Now, the next time you eat, you need even more insulin because just like wearing a jacket, you first feel it, then you don't feel it. The body, when it has high levels of insulin all the time, it becomes insensitive to it. And that's what's happening. We are a hormonally modified human being now.